श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरिओ कृष्णा गोविंदय गोपीजनवल्लभाय स्वाहा हरि 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 नारायण हरि 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 नारायण हरि 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 नारायण राधे राधे सॉरी मेरा वॉइस थोड़ा बदल गया दो दो दिन से वोकल कॉर्ड्स का ज़्यादा यूज़ हुआ तो कुछ हो सकता है पानी बदल गया सर्दी कोई बात नहीं अभी ठीक है ना सुनाई तो दे रहा है आप लोगों को वॉइस को तो कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है चल भागवत के माधुर्य जो आप अनुभव करेंगे उसके बीच में हमारा आवाज थोड़ा सा टेढ़ा रहेगा माफ करना हम तो अनफॉर्चुनेटली और फॉर्चुनेटली टुडे मॉर्निंग वे हैव टू स्टार्ट विथ शिवाज एंगर इतना एंगर के मेरा त्रोट ही चढ़ा गया चीनी कृष्ण परमात्मा ने नमः व्हेन आई थिंक कल का व्हाट वी डिस्कस यू रिमेंबर और डू यू गो टू योर रूम्स एंड फॉर व्हेन दे सॉ सती डिस्ट्रॉइंग हर The attendants of Sati rush towards Daksha with the intention of killing them, but the Ribus saved them. In the meantime, Sage Narada went to Mahadeva. First, he said, "Narayana, Narayana," to Shiva, and then related to him about the happenings at the Yajna Shala. and the tragic end of sati and also about the routing of the pramatha ganas the important ganas by the power of bhrigu mahadeva you generally you will see in all the puranas including the shiva purana mahadeva usually is always tranquil no moment whatever you say the gods fight and go to kailash ah says no. so wo to apne bhang mein dubi rehte hain matlab wo bhang nahi jo patte mein milta hai alag cheez hai mahadeva was not surprised about the surprise i must tell you another little story in uh, badri narayan is also called kedar khand the first starting point was kedar so it's called kedar khand so during pilgrim season people used to go to have a darshan of nar narayan of the two peaks where the yogis had meditated narayan narayan i mean so in that first two season shiva said from kedar to parvati let's also go for a walk to badri so they went to badri and they were walking they saw there was a child crying said my parents have left me i have nobody a oh, sweet child please do something about me help me parvati was very compassionate she looked at the little child's face and she said i cannot leave him here so shiva as mahadeva was not surprised he just smiled he said what do you want to do she said i want to take him with me and we'll keep him with me mm. okay while they were taking the baby 
Mahadeva told Parvati, you have no idea who this little fellow is. <laughs> anyway, let's go. So, they went and in a small kutir where they were staying. Then morning they went in the morning. The baby said, I am not coming. So they went, took a darshan of Nara Narayan, went to the Alakananda, came back. If they wanted to get into the house, it was locked from inside. So they said, what happened? He said, no, 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 stay out. This is my place, I am not going anywhere. You stay out. It was locked. Parvati said, what to do? He said, I told you. That is none other than that Narayan. <laughs> and now he is not going. So the Badri Kashram, Badri Narayan was established. So like that, Mahadeva was not surprised. He knew all along that something like this would happen. But then all his sorrow suddenly turned into anger. A very rare instance. In his fury, he pulled out a strand from his matted locks and flung it on the ground. Mahadeva's matted hair strands are full of devatas. Not like human beings' matted hair. Full of devatas. When he pulled out one strand of his hair and threw it down, the fire-like form of Virabhadra manifested itself. He was fierce to look at Virabhadra. He was so big, he seemed to measure the distance between the heavens and the earth. Now in the Bhagavat, everything is mega. There is nothing small. Everything is a... You need a large heart not small, looking into those atoms with microscope. <laughs> so, I am reminded, Sri Ramakrishna Varamahamsa had a disciple, what's his name, I forgot, he didn't become a sannyasin, what Masha I forgot? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Huh? Nag Masha. So Nag Masha was a homeopath. So wherever he went, he used to carry his box, tiny pills. One day Thakur told him, Hey, Nag, you want to expand. You want the whole infinite being to get into you, right? Your whole life is spent looking into the small tablets. You will never succeed, throw it. So he went to the banks of the Ganges and threw the box into the river. Came back. Then Thakur smiled at him in the evening and said, Did you see it? He said, I don't need to see it. He said, What? He said, You are there. Why should I see anything else? <laughs> anyway. So, he had a thousand arms and he glowed like fire. He was dark like the rain cloud and his eyes were spitting fire. He was also wearing a garland of skulls like Mahadeva. He fell at the feet of his Lord and said, What do you want me to do? <laughs> Go, said Mahadeva. Go to the Ajnashala of Daksha, destroy everything there. Followed by the attendants of Mahadeva. You know who are the attendants of Mahadeva generally? Ghosts, Gauls, all these. They all accompanied Viravadra to the Yajnashala. A fierce cry escaped him and Ghosts, Gauls, Pishaja, they also need a lord, right? <laughs> he rushed towards the holy spot with an uplifted trident in his hand. The dust rising from the rush of the Pramatha Ganas was so great that those in the Yajnashala began to wonder what was happening. What is happening in the north? They asked themselves. 
It cannot be night drawing near. Is it a cloud of dust? Where does this dust come from? There is no breeze blowing. Perhaps Pralaya is approaching the great deluge. Daksha's wife, Prasuti, was afraid that something dreadful was about to happen. She knew that this was imminent when she saw how her daughter had been insulted. She thought, now this is going to happen. And she knew that it is happening now. She knew the greatness of Mahadeva. How could one who defied him be safe from his wrath? Within a few moments, the Agnashala was surrounded by the angry Ganas led by Virabhadra. Panic set in. Everyone was rushing everywhere. Maniman rushed towards Prigu and captured him. Virabhadra caught hold of Daksha in his immense arms. Chandikeshwara pinned Pushana in his arms while Nandi got Bhaga as a share. Virabhadra pulled out the moustaches on the lips of Brigu. Oh God! <laughs> Bhaga, who had incited Daksha in his indifference towards Sati by just moving his eyebrows, suffered for what he had done. Both his eyes were destroyed. When Mahadeva was insulted long ago by Daksha in the other Yaga, Pushan had the indiscretion to laugh. So now Virabhadra poked and all his teeth were lost. Virabhadra then sat on the chest of Daksha and tried to cut off his head but he was not able to do so. For a while he was nonplussed. He didn't realize that Daksha had a boon that no weapon could kill him. Even if one has a boon that no weapon can kill, there is still a way of killing if Mahadeva wants. Hmm? He then realized that because of the fact that he was performing the yajna, Daksha was immune from weapons. Virabhadra now knew what he should do. He strangled Daksha with his bare hands. And that. He then severed the head from the body and threw it into the fire as an offering. The Agnashala was destroyed completely and the attendants led by Virabhadra returned to Kailasha. Now, all those who had survived the massacre went to Brahma. This is what everybody does, go to Brahma. And describe the calamity that had befallen them. Brahma and Vishnu had not been present at the Yajna since they did not want to take part in a ritual which did not include Mahadeva. So they had not gone. Which as a matter of fact was being performed with the sole intention of insulting Mahadeva. When they told Brahma about the happenings at the Yajna Shala, he said, when a powerful one does something wrong, his being powerful does not in any way justify his followers to behave in the same manner towards the victim of injustice. It is not good. You sided with Daksha. When he performed the Yajna, you attended it knowing fully well that it was a gesture to insult Mahadeva. Since you have wronged him, there is nothing else for you to do except go and fall at the feet of Mahadeva and seek his pardon. He has been greatly wronged. His mind is still seething with pain because of the treatment of Daksha towards his beloved wife, Sati. Sati is dead because of Daksha. 
Mahadeva continues to be angry, the world will come to an end. Go to him at once and pacify. Brahma then went to Kailasha, the abode of Mahadeva. It was a picturesque spot. The river Nanda was flowing there. Facing the mountain was the city Alaka, ruled by Kubera. The devas who were with Brahma stood rooted to the ground, looking at the lake. When the heavenly lotuses by name Saugandika were floating, Nanda and her sister Alaknanda were both flowing out of the city of Alaka. There was an immense banyan tree there. Under the tree, they found Mahadeva after sending Virabhadra. They found Mahadeva immersed in tapas. His right hand was holding a string of beads. Brahma went near him and accompanied by the devas who stood with folded palms, began to speak softly. He didn't know what mood he was in. So Brahma decided, let me start softly. Hmm? First, he praised him. But there was a note of pleading underlying the chanting of the words. Instead of just normally saying Om Namah Shiva, I was saying Om Namah Shiva. <laughs> Mahadeva was aroused out of his yoga. He knew that Brahma was there. He stood up from his seat and greeted Brahma by bending his head in reverence. The others around also bowed before Brahma. Brahma accepted it all with a smile and then spoke to Mahadeva. He said, Lord, as you are of the world, of the mind and the senses, it is but right that you should ab abandon this anger against humanity. You must forgive the faults of the ignorant. Please make it possible for the interrupted Yajna of Daksha to be completed, Raksha to be completed. Forgive the Jamanas who denied you a share of the Havis. Make the maimed whole again. Forgive them all. Mahadeva smiled at them and said, I am not angry with all those who took part in the Yajna. But I have to punish Daksha if he needs to find his ultimate freedom. He had to be cured of his pride and arrogance. Incidentally, the others were also punished. Daksha can come back to his life, but his head has already been burnt. We will fit a goat's head. <laughs> so he can come back with the head of a goat. This is unheard of plastic surgery. Hmm. Hmm? Nandikeshwara's words cannot become false. Daksha's mind is now cleansed. As for the men, they will be whole again. Don't worry. Brahma asked him to go to the Yajnashala with them and he agreed. All that the Lord said came true. Daksha rose up as out of deep sleep and he found that he was in the presence of the Devas. His mind which had been clouded because of his hatred for the Lord had now become clear like an autumn lake. He tried to speak but he could not. Tears choked him, tears at the thought of his daughter. His beloved child, Sati, who had to die because of his arrogance. 
he composed himself and spoke to Mahadeva. He said, I insulted you. The world thinks that you have punished me for it. But in reality, what you did was an act of grace. Vishnu and you have so much affection for mankind. Even when ignorant and Brahmins behave as though they know so much, <laughs> you smile indulgently at them and unmindful of their stupidity, you are kind to them. When such is the case, how can anyone imagine that you have punished me, who has never been doing, who has ever been doing all that my father had instructed me to do? It is unfortunate that I, who could have known so much, knew nothing. The reality escaped me while I was caught in a web of illusion. Believe me, it can happen to anybody. Small to the big, you build your own illusion. Hmm? We, sorry, we build our own illusion. And we sit inside that illusion thinking that we are mighty. Nobody can do anything to us. But then it takes time to realize this illusion. When this is understood, one becomes free. When one thinks, suppose I think I am a great man, suppose. I, I don't think so. Anyway. And then, I see that some people are not giving me enough respect, some people are. And it is compounded by the fact that some are giving more respect. Some are putting so many garlands on your head, you can't straighten up your head. It's caught in this. One weaves an illusion about it. One should understand, yes. Okay. Joho, soho. You know, if you don't understand that, you can never be free. This is what is being expressed in the Bhagavad. Every single incident, every single sentence in the Bhagavad has an impact on your daily life and your march towards freedom, towards the Lord. So he says, Daksha says, the reality escaped me while I was caught in a web of illusion. And sometimes, gods themselves create that illusion so that you are caught up in it. And you think, oh, it is a great thing. Huh? The moment you realize, oh, this is stupid, you are free. That illusion made me behave foolishly. In the midst of everyone, I hurled insult after insult at you. And yet you have been so much affectionate to me, unmindful of what I have done. You have made me clean. You have given me a new birth, so I will use it for a better purpose. All that I can do is fall at your feet and ask for pardon. The yajna was resumed. Lord Narayana appeared and the three gods presided over the yajna. When it was ended, Daksha honored the gods, the devas and the guests properly. Devas returned to their abode after the conclusion of the great eventful yajna. Daksha was now freed of his pride and arrogance and became a highly chastened person. Only one problem. Bhagavat in this chapter describes it in one sentence and stops. It says, only Sati was dead. It's a very poignant little sentence at the end. Only Sati was dead.
Uttanapada, the son of Manu, had two wives, Suniti and Surichi, not to be followed. <laughs> yes, if you are the son of Manu, yes. Suniti had a son named Dhruva and Suruchi's son was called Uttama. Suniti, however, was not dear to the king. Suruchi was his favorite queen. This is the problem. Once the king was in the garden playing with Uttama, he had taken him on his lap and he was petting the child, Uttama. To him came Dhruva, the other wife Suniti's son. He wanted to sit on his father's lap. He was trying to do so. Suruchi saw it and rushing near, she dragged him away from his father, saying, You are the son of the king, no doubt, but you are not my son, and so you will not have the privilege of sitting on your father's lap. You are striving for the impossible. Incidentally, it was Dhruva who strived for the impossible and attained it. Almost impossible. You do not seem to realize that you are unfortunate. Your misfortune is just this. You are the son of another woman. If you want to sit on your father's lap like Uttama, then you will have to perform a long penance. Pray to the Lord to make you the son of Surichi in your next birth. How, how arrogant can somebody be? Hmm? If you don't next birth be born as Surichi's son, you will not be able to sit on your father's lap. The king was listening to her. He did not speak a word in protest. Why? He was infatuated with his wife. Hurt by the cruel words of his stepmother, Dhruva, hissing like a wounded serpent, looked accusingly at his father, who was sitting silent. Dhruva rushed from there and went to his mother. Without speaking a word, he began to cry loudly. The mother placed him on her lap and after comforting him, she got the story of what happened. Suniti could do nothing but weep. Drowned as she was in sorrow, still she did not lose her gentle nature. Which means what? She didn't go to the other lady and catch her by her hair. She just kept quiet and wept. She said, My child, remember one fact, that is, when one wishes someone ill, that ill is revisited on the wisher. So never at any time think ill of anybody. The king does not like me. He does not want me to serve him even as a handmaiden. Such an unfortunate woman happens to be your mother. What Suriji said is true. Because you are my son, you do not have the privilege of sitting on the king's lap. Do not be angry with your stepmother because she has spoken such words. On the contrary, do what she asked you to do. Pray to Lord Narayana, who is the greatest among the great, who is the refuge of all who are sufferers. Take refuge at the feet of the Lord, who is the refuge of all gods, of Brahma 
and your grandfather Manu and all the denizens of heavens. Be attached to the Lord. Other attachments are not worth. Hmm? Become attached to Him and only to Him. Speak His name and see His form. Pray to Him. He is sure to rid you of all unhappiness. I can see no other way of comforting you. Dhruva was bent on doing what his mother said would be good for him. He left his father's city and wandered about without knowing how to go about his penance. Now who would come to teach him? Somebody is always waiting for situations. So Dhruva heard the sound of the Veena and then he heard Narai and Harai. Narada with his yogic powers knew what was happening. He was reminded of his earlier birth, earlier Janma, when he was just such a child wandering in the quest of God. He told himself, I must help this child. He is from the race of warriors and he has been hurt by the words of his stepmother. Narada hurried to where Dhruva was and placing his hand on the child's head blessed him. He said, you are still a child, you are five years old. Your place is by the side of your toys and such things. You are still too young to let insult have so much influence on your mind. In this world, good and bad, praise and censure, all are the results of one's own action and nothing else. It is the human being's delusion that causes it. If God's grace is with you, then unhappiness will never come near you. His grace is the only thing needed. If it is not there, no amount of energy or attempt will bring any fruit. It's up to you to be satisfied with what the Lord meets out to you as your share of pleasure and pain. Your mother has told you that you should take refuge in Narayan. I know you are bent on performing tapas. My child, do you not know that it is not easy to please this Narayana? Rishis and yogis have performed penance for years on end and still they have not been able to see him. It needs concentration, it needs sacrifice, it needs a sense of detachment and patience. Tapas spread over janma after janma. Ask me. And still, in spite of all this, he is very hard to find. Please give up this quest. Abandon this childish obstinacy. You can come back to it later. Penance is a course to be adopted by you when you are in your old age. God has ordained that man should enjoy a certain share of happiness and a certain share of sorrow. It is not right to rebel against this law of nature. Narada is trying to see what this boy is. The wise say that a man's punya decreases when he enjoys the good things of life. And this papa decreases when sorrow visits him. And so he reaches the very boon of release from both if he learns to be even-tempered. unaffected by either. When you see one more fortunate than you, 
It is not right that you should be jealous of him. You should show him affection. And if you see a man lacking in good qualities, you should be sorry for him and not hate him or sneer at him. If you meet one who is your equal, you should then be friendly with him. Such a man who does this will never be unhappy. Dhruva said, It is my good fortune that I have met you. It is fortunate that I have I should have found you who can tell me clearly these secrets about pleasure and pain. And yet, because of my being an undisciplined Kshatriya, perhaps the words of Surichi have hurt me. And your words do not reach me deep inside. They ought to impress me, but they are not. Please have pity on me and my ignorance. Teach me the method by which I can reach the Lord. I don't want anything else. I want to attain a state higher than the highest. And I want to pray to the Lord to grant me that. Please teach me. You are, I have heard, born the son of Brahma. And you wander all over the world, the universe, plucking the strings of your veena, but with only one thing in your mind, to do good to mankind. Please have compassion on me. Narada was charmed by the naivety and sweetness of the words spoken by Dhruva. And he made up his mind to help him. He said, The path suggested by your mother is the correct path. I was testing you. I will grant you what you desire. The ultimate refuge of all is Narayan. Pray to him. Set your mind steadfastly on him. He is known to all that any desire will be granted by him. When he is asked, set your mind on Narayan. He will hear your prayers. May you be successful in your endeavor. My child, go to the banks of the river Yamuna, where the Lord is always present. Go to the holy spot which is called Madhuana. Bathe in the pure waters of the river three times a day. And then do your pranayam. Set your mind on the Lord and His form. He is easily pleased. I will teach you the mantra, the incantation, reciting which you will be able to summon the Lord to your presence. So Dhruva is all attention. Now here comes the key. So Narada says, here is the mantra, listen to me. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. This is the Maha Mantra in the Bhagavad. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. When this mantra is constantly repeated, the Lord will grant you all your desires. This is called Bhakti Yoga as the easiest, which is also very dear to Narayana. Narada then described in detail the form of the Lord and Dhruva fixed his mind as he heard it being described. His mind was filled with Narayana lying on Ananta, the great snake. The child could easily see the lotus rising from the navel of the Lord. He could visualize the yellow silk which draped the form of the Lord and the tender smile on his lips and the compassion in his lotus eyes, Dhruva made Pradakshana to Narada and fell at his feet. Taking leave of his guru, the young child walked towards Madhuvana on the banks of Yamuna. One person in the Bhagavat 
who claims that Narada is his guru. <laughs> On the banks of the river Yamuna, at the holy spot by name Madhuvan, Dhruva began to perform the penance as taught by Narada. For the first month, don't try your You cannot in Kaliyuga. It's impossible to do this kind of penance. But there are easier ways. So why would you do that? Hmm? As difficult as it is to reach equilibrium of mind and realize the Lord in Kaliyuga, so also easy ways are given by which one can reach. Heart is important. Nothing else. The heart is not open, there is not the pulsation of love and affection going on there. In all your life you will sit breathing in and out and nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, pranayam is described, but for a purpose. So for the first month, he lived on the fruits which were found in the forest. The second month, he sustained himself by eating grass and dried leaves. Third month, only water held his life. During the fourth month, he even stopped drinking water. The air he breathed was the only food he was taking. He was bent on only one thing, the mantra which he learned from Narada. Mentally, he repeated the mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And this was all that mattered to the child who was barely five years old. Now is the problem. The devas found this tapas terrible. They tried to bring obstacles to his concentration. Whenever the devas see humans rise to divinity, they are upset. So then who will play with the devas? Who are the devas? Who is the head of the devas? Indra. And who are the devas? The Panchendriyas. The Panchendriyas are there to enjoy. Here is a man who is trying to transcend them. Devas are very upset. What will happen? He may become superior to us. He may command us instead of we commanding them, which is the usual position. So the Devas found this tapas terrible. They tried to bring obstacles to his concentration. Wild animals and serpents and even evil spirits were sent to frighten the young child. But he heeded them not. So intense was his absorption that he did not even know that they were there. He was intent only on his tapasya. The three worlds began to tremble in fear because of it. The devas at last went to Narayana and they said, Hello. <laughs> you are lying on your serpent happily. Hmm? Never has this happened before. All living beings are finding that they cannot breathe because Dhruva is intent on his uh, penance, please have mercy on us and stop this tapasya. Narayana said, I will now go to him and try. It has lasted five months. Maybe I should go and bless this child. Narayana came to the banks of the Yamuna. See what a five-year child can do. He brought the Lord to Yamuna.
Now what happened when he arrived at the Yamuna? Dhruva found his heart. Suddenly the image of the Lord he was seeing all these days disappear. But the Lord has come out. He was aroused from his samadhi. And when he opened his eyes, he found the Lord standing before him. The child was overcome by the suddenness of all it. He looked at the form of the Lord as though he would drink him with his eyes. He held out his arms as if to embrace the Lord. His eyes were raining tears and his face was wreathed in smiles. He fell at the feet of the Lord and stood up looking at him and looking at him. His lips moved but he could not speak a word. Vasudeva also forgotten. Namo Bhagavati. All gone. So he stood for a while. Stunned. Lord Narayana of course knew what the child wanted. Dhruva wanted to praise him but he could not. Since he didn't know how to praise him. He knew not the words. So Narayana gently touched the boy's cheek with his conch, which was snow white and which is said to personify the Vedas. The moment the conch touched his face, Dhruva became enlightened. He became articulate. His words were those of Rishis when they talk of the glories of the Lord. Dhruva said, I salute you who entered into me and gave me the power to speak. This is the beginning of Dhruva's praise. My Lord, my power of speech was asleep and you gave it an awakening. You pervade the Indriyas, the sense organs. With your power, you give life to them. You are the only truth. You create the illusion Maya and you the creator of Mahat and Aham Tattvas. You have created the three gunas and the presiding deities of the Indriyas. And you enter all these and remain in them like fire residing inside Dharani. People who do not know the truth about you think this Maya to be different from you. Brahma was granted the vision which made him see the world like a sleeper viewing the dream from which he is awakened. How can anyone forget you, who is everything? You will rid man of births and deaths if he worships you. Ignorant men worship you and ask favors, this also you grant. Having seen you, who is the Kalpa Viksha, desire fulfilling tree, granting immortality, if a man asks for pleasures enjoyed by mortal body, he should be considered the most unfortunate among men. The ecstasy which one experiences by thinking on you and by listening to your stories related by your devotees is even greater than the Brahmi state, which is nothing but bliss. As for ordinary mortals, who exists for pleasure only. He is like one sailing in a chariot which had been hurled suddenly to the earth. He will never know the ecstasy of knowing you. When even the Brahmi state cannot equal the joy achieved by the thoughts of you, do I have to mention the unfortunate condition of human beings who live in the world of pleasure thinking it is the greatest of joy and who die when the time comes like dry leaves falling from a tree. Please grant me only this, that I will think on you night and day. Grant me the company of noble souls who are your bhaktas. In the company of such people listening to your glories all the time, I can become drunk with joy 
and so I can cross this fearful, pain-filled ocean called birth and death without any trouble. When a man becomes happy in the company of your bhaktas, he will not think of this perishable body, his family, his house, wealth and belongings mean nothing to him. As for me, I have been granted a sight of this form. But I am not able to comprehend your form as Ishvara, the cause of the universe. It is therefore evident that my mind is not completely free of desires. I am not seeing the form of you which is sleeping in yoga trance after the great deluge. The entire universe is withdrawn into you and your bed is ananta, unending, the other form of time. Out of your navel is born Brahma. I imagine that form of yours and prostrate before it. I am still the Jivatma. And you are the Paramatma. You are pure. The Jiva is not. It is tainted with desires. You are knowledge and Jiva is ignorance. Avidya. You are life and Jiva is inert. You are imperishable while the jiva suffers under the delusion that it is ever undergoing change. You are the ancient and the jiva is fated to have births. You control the gunas but jiva is their slave. I salute you who are the Brahman, the Purusha, the cause of this universe. Narayana was pleased with this young worshipper. He said, I know what made you take upon yourself this difficult task. I will grant you what you wanted then. I am assigning for you a place which is eternal. I have decided to place you so that the sun and the moon will revolve around you, which will be circumambulated, circumambulated even by the seven rishis, the sapta rishis. The stars will be wheeling around you. Your father will crown you king after he renounces the kingdom and goes in search of peace. You will ever be devoted to me and to my bhaktas. In their company, you will spend all your time. You will rule the world for 30,000 years. You will perform many yajnas and finally, you will see me again. Ultimately, you will reach me. The Lord vanished from his sight and Dhruva was left alone, living the moment over and over again in his mind. The young child thought of returning to the city ruled by his father. He was glad in his, in a way, but his heart was not elated at the turn of events. He told himself, I have seen the Lord, Narayana, and his presence bless me. I attain the joy which even rishis like Sanaka and Sanat Kumara have not attained. Fool that I was, I did not ask for moksha. <laughs> it is just my misfortune that my mind was clouded. Sage Narada spoke rightly and he said, This is not the age to take insults and applause to heart. I was foolish to have disregarded his words. The Lord has granted me a boon far inferior to moksha. I should have asked for release from bondage, but I didn't. I was tongue-tied. I did not do so. My ego evidently is not completely destroyed. So my mind became clouded. I became a beggar and am ashamed of myself. After he had spoken to Dhruva, the sage Narada went to the palace of Uttanava. He knew that some work has to be done here. When he had been welcomed properly and given his seat of honor, Narada asked the king, Why do you look so depressed? Has any calamity? See the question, whoever you meet, why are you looking so worried? What's your problem? Hmm? He said, 
what has befallen your kingdom? Why are you looking so depressed? The king sighed deeply and said, I have been heartless. Obsessed with this woman, I allowed my young son of five years to go into the forest. He is probably wandering about in the forest. Will he not be hungry and thirsty? How can his tender form bear the difficulties of a forest? I hope he will not be eaten up by wolves and other animals. He wanted to sit on my lap and in my blindness I prevented him. Hurt by my indifference he has left. Are you surprised then that I am depressed? Narsana smiled at him and said, Stop mourning for your son who is protected by someone mightier than you, Narayana himself. Your son will be the greatest among men. You do not know the greatness of Dhruva, of the future of this child, as you call him. Your son will achieve what the Devas have not been able to do, and because of him your name will live in the world forever. You will be known as Uttanapada, the father of the great Dhruva Swami. <laughs> do not worry. Dhruva will come to you very soon. Five months passed. News reached him that the sun was returning from the forest. Entire city was lit up. Dhruva reached the outskirts of the city. Jumping out of his chariot, Uttanapada ran to his son and embraced him with tears in his eyes. Suruchi embraced him. And with her voice faltering because of emotion, she said, May you live long. Years passed. The king installed Dhruva on the throne. Dhruva ruled the earth for 30,000 years. The words of the Lord always remained in his mind that after 30,000 years of doing his duty, he would be free to seek the comfort at the feet of Narayana. Dhruva, with a smile of happiness at the thought of his freedom, installed his son on the throne and went to Badrikashrama to perform tapasya. It's a nice message. If you have done your work, go to Badrikashrama. <laughs> What are you doing here? <laughs> the work is not finishing. What to do? <clears throat> Dhruva with a smile of happiness at the thought of his imminent freedom. Oh, okay, he went off. There he was immersed in yoga. He was blind and deaf to everything around him. A glowing chariot reached his presence, and out of it came divine beings who were servants of Narayana. So if you go to the upper reaches of uh, Badri, you might probably see those chariots. Hmm? Hmm? He honoured them and he said, years ago, when you were a child of five, you prayed to the Lord and He granted you a place in heaven, a place higher than anyone can expect. Even the sun and the moon and the stars and the seven rishis will make pradakshanas to you. All the other stars and planets will alter their course. Please enter the chariot and reach your appointed place. As he was about to enter the chariot, death came near Dhruva. Death. And bowing down to him said, My Lord, please accept me. Dhruva said, I welcome you. And placing his foot on the bowed head of death, Dhruva entered the chariot. And became Dhruva the pole star, 
around which everything rotates. Now, Dhruva had a son whose name was Utkala. Utkala was a great philosopher. Even when he was young, he had reached the state of understanding the Brahman. He did not care for the throne and the pomp and the splendor of the royal court. In fact, he took very little interest in ruling the kingdom that people mistook him to be ignorant and dull. He did not bother about his appearance and those who looked at him did not pay any respect to him. Finally, the elders of the city thought that he was not in the least efficient. They crowned his younger brother, Valsara. Vatsara, not Valsala, as the king. <laughs> One of the descendants of Vatsara was a king by name Anga. He was a Rajarishi and once he performed the Ashwamedha. At the end of the Yaga, the Devas are supposed to come to receive the share of the Havish. But when they were summoned by the incantations, the Devas refused to come. Usually after the Yaga is about to finish, the Devas are Ahavan, Avahan, asked to come and receive the Havish from the sacrifice. Usually this is the case. But this time when he did it, when Vatsara did that, the Devas refused to come. This is a peculiar situation. They said, O King, everyone was surprised. And they asked the Jamana, the king, one who performs the sacrifice, head is called the Jamana. They asked him, O king, the devas have not appeared to accept our oblations into the fire. We can assure you that we have performed the yaga without any mistake being committed. There is no fault on our part. We do not know why the devas have not come. The king was sorely distressed. He addressed those who had assembled there. You are all wise men, you all wish me well, he said. The devas have not responded to our summons. Can anyone tell me what my fault is? What has been committed that such a thing has come to pass? I did not know why it has happened. Can somebody find the reason? The wise men spoke. They said, O king of kings, you are not to blame in the performance of the Yaga. We know the reason for us. You are a man of great virtue, no doubt. But you have not been sinless in your previous birth. As a result of that, you are childless. We will try to help you. Perform another Yaga with the purpose of getting a son. Lord Narayana, who will be worshipped, will be so pleased that he will gratify your desire. When they see that Narayana himself is pleased to bless you with a son, the Devas will fall in line and receive the shares of your Havish. They took it upon themselves to perform a Yajna which was to honor Narayana. When the yajna was coming to an end, out of the fire rose up a form wearing golden ornaments. And in his hand he held a vessel of gold. He held it out to the king, who found a divine payasa inside it. With the blessings of the elders who had assembled there, the king smelt the paisa and gave it to his wife, Sunita. 
the course of time, he only smelled it. <laughs> In course of time, a son was born to the king. This son, born of the sacrifice, was the abode of adharma. Even when he was a child, his greatest enjoyment was to hurt living beings. As he grew older, he would go into the forest to hunt. But he was bent on hunting at will, on gen killing gentle and harmless animals. He was so cruel that people would avoid him. When he appeared in sight, men would say, here comes Vena, the cruel prince, run away from the spot. While playing with his companions, he would kill them without any compunction. Imagine what he got simply by smelling the paisa. Hmm? Next time somebody gives you paisa, eat it, don't smell. <laughs> the king tried his best to bring him around to the right path. He tried all the four methods. Sama, Dana, Veda, Danda. No avail. He was unable to change the nature of his son. The king was very unhappy. He told himself, God is kind towards those who have no children. Because they are unhappy as a result of the atrocities committed by a bad son, because of being the father of a bad son, a man inherits infamy, hatred of all men and endless mental pain. The really wise man will never desire to have a son. <laughs> when the entire house and the family and the country is unhappy, just look at my son. And when I think of myself, I feel that God has really been good to me in giving me a bad son instead of a good one. Because of the unhappiness caused by this son, I have become disgusted with my home and my very life. I dare not move about in the presence of good men, burdened with the sin of having produced this fellow. A good son would not have let his father adopt the path of renunciation so soon. I would have been bound to my family. And this bondage has been severed because of the behavior of my son. The king was very unhappy. No one would talk to him and he was drowned in misery. One night, he was tossing to and fro sleeplessly on his bed. Suddenly he made up his mind. The poor unfortunate king, Anga, abandoned his bed with it, his home, his wife, and all things of this world. He walked away quietly from the city, never to return. The subjects were grief-stricken at the departure of the king. They knew that the son's sinfulness had made the father adopt this course. King Anga had gone in search of peace. The ministers and other wise men went on a deputation to the rishis and asked them for advice. They said that a kingdom had to have a king. And so, much as they disapproved of him, the ministers had to crown the wicked Vena as the king. So Vena became the king. Can you imagine? Even before he was king, what was he? And now he has become the king. It happens everywhere, this hereditary business. There followed a reign of terror. Bad as he was already, Vena's behavior became incorrigible after he became king. 
He was drunk with power and immense wealth. He had no respect for elders. In fact, he made it a point to insult elders. You see, an old man, he said, hey, old man. He won the reputation as the most arrogant, cruel and heartless king that ever sat on a throne. He gave orders that there should be no homas, no yajnas, nothing. The wise conferred again and considered ways and means to stop this anarchy. It was daily getting worse. They were caught on the horns of a dilemma. If the king were to rule the country as he was doing now, the subjects won't be able to bear it any longer. On the other hand, if there was no king, then robbers and highwaymen would raid the country and again the subjects would suffer. When I had been made king, since it was imperative to have a king, it was known to all that he was unfit for the task, but they never bargained for this state of affairs. He was the cause of fear for everyone. They thought they would try to see if they can instill a sense of duty in him. So, the ministers went to the rishis and they agreed to do their best. They went to the presence of the king and suppressing with difficulty the anger which was uppermost in their minds, they spoke to him softly. They said, Dear son, the rishis, Dear son, please listen to our words carefully. Your life, your wealth, your good name are all involved in danger. Dharma, when practiced with purity of mind, thought, word and deed will lead to greatness. This adharma which you are practicing is not good either for you or for your country. You should protect your subjects and not harass them. Abandon this type of rule and be good, O king. King Vena turned a deaf ear to all his their pleadings. He said, you are the ones who are following the path of Adharma, not me. You worship some god instead of me. So he has already appointed himself god now. The king is the image of God and he should be worshipped, no one else. All the celestial beings find a home in the body of a king who has been anointed. So I am Narayana in person, worthy of all the highest honor. People do not know this truth, so they go to hell. Hereafter, you must perform yajnas, but in my honor. For me, and sacrifices in my name. No one else is worthy of worship except me, who I am your king. So he anointed himself as God himself. Hmm. The rishis were horrified by his words. They looked at him for a while and they thought of the country with this tyrant on the throne. The anger which they had been keeping in their hearts flared up at the words of Vena. They were great rishis with powerful ways of returning. They thought to themselves, this man deserves to die. He equals himself to Agneshwara Narayana and he has thus sealed his own fate. He has already been killed by the Lord for his arrogance. We will have to destroy him for the sake of protecting his subjects. So they sat just outside with their minds they invoked Yama, the Lord of Death. And in two seconds, Vena was dead. Imagine the Rishi sitting there, calling Yama, 
on the hotline <laughs> and saying, here is this guy, he has to go. <laughs> There's no way out. Yama said, yes sir, here he goes. Good. The rishis went back to their ashrama without looking back. They didn't even want to see. So, now we will read about a great king, Prithu, after this terrible king, Vena. Do you want me to skip? <laughs> Today is the third day. Hmm? Huh? Hmm. Let me see. Can't skip. There are beautiful chapters like Bharata, Andhra, Ajamila. It is there are doubt. Churning of the ocean. Now, We'll adjust somehow. We'll skip through. I'm um, tomorrow if we are still there, then I'll skip some. Go to the family tree of the Yadavas and then go on slowly. Hmm. Hmm. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Radhe Radhe. So, um, I'm leaving it to you. Either we do go to the section and do Prithu, or we can skip to Puranjana, the life of Puranjana. Can't hear a thing. You need time. We need to... Okay, I decide. Then I am using the skipping rope. <laughs> and then we will skip to Hiranyakashapu and Prahlad. Because there are other kings, many minor kings. But we don't have to go into everything. You can go home and read the Bhagavad hmm? So here, we are going to deal with another famous king in the Srimad Bhagavat. There was once a famous king by name Puranjana. He had a friend. Why I am doing this is because only here it is written famous king. Hmm? He had a friend whose name was Avignata. Avignata. The friend that earned that name because no one knew what he did and how he acted. Most unpredictable. Avignata. No one could figure out at one moment, what he's going to do, what he's thinking. So he, his name was Avignata. His presence also, now Avignata was a friend of Puranjana, okay? The famous king Puranjana. And nobody knew what he thought. It was unpredictable. Early morning, he would get up, before breakfast, nobody knows why he is so agitated. He will walk up and down, curse other people, you know, and then have breakfast. 
or one day his mood may change and he praise everybody and say oh they are saints they are good people so his name was avijnata his presence was almost unknown to everyone unless one thought of him and asked him to be with him this avijnata unless you ask him to be with you he won't be there otherwise if you say please be with me avijnata he would make his appearance ha huh? puranjana and he were very great friends the famous king puranjan in fact they were considered by everyone as inseparables they would ever be together and so it went on for a long time as time went on puranjana became restless avijnata was not though he was won by his friend puranjana left his home in the company of his friend and went in search of a new home a new dwelling place he wanted a city fit enough to be ruled by him so he searched all the world over for it for a long time he wandered in search of a city for himself he traveled far and wide and yet he could not find what he was looking for he was very unhappy since many of the places he found even tried were not good enough for him to stay in so he kept on traveling happens to you many of us also we think this place is nice to stay then you stay there you say no then we relocate ourselves this is nice place mm-hmm. after some time and it happens like that puranjana in puranjana it was more serious every now and then he would shift once on the southern slopes of the himalayas he found a city it was a beautiful city and it had nine gateways to reach so anybody could come from any direction uh, nine dwaras to go in there were many turrets and there was a great wall around it a fort lovely gardens were to be found everywhere and all around the city there was a moat you know it is a moat a canal dug around the fort so that people cannot enter easily during war we have to put the gate like a bridge the houses in the city were well designed they were built of gold silver and iron and inlaid with stones like sapphires crystals amethysts pearls emeralds and rubies there was a mansion with seven floors the streets were wide and large there was a market place where there were bazaars and there were gambling places in plenty very big city pillars adorned with corals and silks were to be found everywhere and the city was called bhogavati hmm bhoga is what enjoyment bhogo yoga yate so bhoga is enjoyment 
that is the tantric definition of yoga bhogo yoga i say so city was named bhogavati adjoining the city was a heavenly garden all trees of heaven were found not ordinary trees heavenly trees the birds and the bees viewed each other a wide with each other in making sweet music there was a lake and across the lake blew a pleasant cool breeze the breeze was laden with perfume innumerable flowers the trees on the edge of the lake made the place delightfully shady and inviting you describe you feel ha ah, it should be in a city like that. the cuckoos were making sweet music in the mango grove and the king puranjana wandered around drinking in the beauty of the place all of a sudden in this beautiful city they came within his sight he was carefully walking around a beautiful woman he thought that she was a heavenly damsel her form was captivating her eyes her lips her hips and her lovely breasts were in inter- i am not in the bhart <laughs> were intoxicantly lovely she might have been about 16 her eyes looked here and there and her eyelids fluttered like the wings of a butterfly what did she do she looked at him and away from him the golden earrings which she wore in her small ears seemed to whisper secrets into her ears making her blush she was dark and her form was swaying captivatingly as she moved puranjana stood rooted to the spot gazing at her he came to his senses a moment later and he saw that she was strangely attended by various people there seemed to be 10 main attendants and these 10 had a 100 women as companions an immense cobra with five heads was walking ahead of her as though keeping close watch on her guarding her. Puranjana pulled his eyes away from the others and looked at her again. The language of her eyes, the sights which made her chest heave, I am using the word, the way she tried in vain to cover them with silk, which she had draped on her shoulders, the way she stood tracing patterns on the ground with her toenail looking all this made him realize that she did not resent his presence that she was interested in him otherwise what do you, you <laughs> pulling her um, thing properly and looking down looking away drawing rounds on the sand with the toes he said uh, and a smile hovered on her lips now this bhagavad is interesting it is very plain nothing to do with my maya vada or anything of that kind it accepts the world Hmm. 
So, a smile hovered on her lips and he went near her. He had to speak to her. He thought, if I don't speak to her, I might die. So he went close to her and he asked her, tell me who you are. Hmm? You are so beautiful, your eyes timid like those of a deer, ah, making me mad. They are like the petals of a lotus. Whose daughter are you? Where have you come from? Where do you belong? Are you a woman of the heavens come down to earth to see his beauty? Are you Hri, the wife of Dharma? Bhavani, the consort of Mahadeva? Are you Saraswati, looking for Brahma? Perhaps you are Lakshmi, the wife of Lord Narayana. Beauty like yours cannot be earthly. What are you thinking about? In your preoccupation, the lotus which was in your hand has fallen down unnoticed. Hmm? You cannot be heavenly, I think, because your feet are touching the ground, so you are earthly. And you have already made me your slave by your beauty and by your captivating looks. Your dark eyes have made me your slave. Then he suddenly said, Will you become mine? After <laughs> saying, I have fallen in love with you. Please make me happy by becoming my wife. Tell me who these attendants are, these ten men and these hundreds of women. How is it possible for you to have this dreadful snake with you all the time, five-hooded fellow walking in front? I am solely puzzled. Please lift up your eyes. He is still drawing rounds in the sand. <laughs> Please lift up your eyes and look at me. I don't know how they are going to make a film out of this. <laughs> with a smile and with halting words, she spoke to him. She said, I do not know who I am, nor do I know who created me. All I know is that I belong to this city and I live here. I do not know who built this city I am. These men, my lord, are my companions and these women who are their attendants are my friends. This five-headed snake guards the city when I am asleep. It's always with me. It is my good fortune that you have come to me you have come in search of pleasure and I can help with the help of these friends of mine gratify all your desires. You can be the lord of the city. I will be by your side. You can drink the cup of joy to fill for a hundred years. You are an ideal man to become my husband. I would never have been happy, never, with a man who is a corner of the pleasures of the senses, who is ever thinking of death which is imminent, who is always thinking of tomorrow and worries about it. Such a man is not dear to me. But you are different. Your thoughts are only of pleasure. You have no thought of tomorrow, nor are you scared at the thought of death. 
you will be satisfied with the happiness that you can get in the present. There is nothing so wonderful. What is? There is nothing so wonderful as the love between man and woman. Nothing else can equal the happiness. You desire me and I am very much in love with you. So come with me to the city called Bhogavati, the city of enjoyment, and we will live happily without a thought for anything else. Now, her name was Puranjani. She and Puranjana lived in that city with nine gates. He lived happily in the inner apartments of the princess and is always with her. Not a moment would he lose her company. He did all that she did. What she desired was what he wanted. If she wanted to sip wine, his desire was also the same. He was hungry when she was hungry. When she sang, he became the words. When she wept, he shed tears with her. And her smile was enough to make him smile. The words he spoke were the words she spoke. And the words he heard had to be the ones that reached her ears. What she thought was sweet smelling was the same for him too. And what was ugly in her sight was aberrant. In short, he had no entity except her. He was so lost in her. Another expression, he was sold out. Puranjana lost all count of time. Days passed him by and then they seemed like moments to him. Children were born to them, they were growing up. Still, Puranjani held him in trial. He did not realize that he was growing old. His age was now fifty. His love for his wife... Hey, Puranjani will go away, hey! <laughs> Dubai mein nahi hai Puranjani. Hmm, hmm. Still, Puranjani held him in thrall. He did not realize that he was growing old. His age was now fifty. His love for his wife became tenfold. And the love he had for his children was also growing. He was lost in the thoughts of himself, his children, his wife, and their love for each other. He did conventional things like performing yagas and yajnas, but the love he had for his wife and the pleasures which she was still giving him were always in his mind and he was happy. He was unconscious of the truth that time was fast slipping by, that his youth had left him long ago, the passage of time was the one thing which he never noticed, which we hardly noticed, right? Old age, the unwelcome guest to the body of a human being in love, came to him and came to stay. Chandavega was the name of a Gandharva chieftain. You know the Gandharvas, they are so attractive. He had 360 powerful servants. These in their turn had the same number of women to attend to. Who? This Chandavega. These men were fair and the women were dark. Chandavega decided to attack the city called Bhogavati. 
Till now everything was hunky dory. Then comes Chandavega. He says, okay, let me attack the city. And he is a king of Gandharvas. With magical powers, beautiful face. With his 360 henchmen and their women, Chandavega went to the vicinity of the city of Bhogavati. He surrounded it from all sides and his intention was to destroy it entirely. The city had the snake to guard it, the five-hooded snake. The snake, Prajagara, with five heads, he tried in vain to stop the attacking forces from destroying the city. He fought valiantly with the enemy which was 720 strong. The fight went on for a hundred years and Prajagara could not withstand the onslaught. Till now he managed. Puranjana was sorely distressed at the state of affairs. The attack had begun long ago. Ever since he came there to live with the woman he loved, the war has started, it is a long time, but he was not lost in his love for wife and children. You know, he was so lost in the love for his wife and children, that he refused to pay attention to the invasion of Chandavega. Now slowly, it was trying to force itself into his thoughts. The fight which was going on, still he refused to pay any thought to what was happening. Kala, time, had a daughter by name Jara. Unfortunately, she was not attractive. No one wanted her. She travelled far and near in search of her husband. No one welcomed her advances and people turned their faces away if she appeared in front of them. Once she came across Narada and fell in love with the young sage. She asked him to take her for a wife. Narada, of course, didn't want any wife, freely going with his. He said, no, sorry. Repulsed by him, she became very angry and cursed him to wander the universe without a place to call his own. That's why Narada is wandering. So all men be careful. <laughs> be wandering. Hmm? Jara then went on with her search for her husband. She went to Yavaneshwara. Who is Yavaneshwara? Death. She only tries to catch the best. First Narada, then Lord Yama. <laughs> Yavaneshwara. And asked him to take her. He looked at her with kindness and pity and said, listen to me, don't be angry for my frankness. You are not attractive, nor are you bent on doing good to anyone. That is the reason why no one is willing to accept you. But I feel sorry for you. I will tell you what you should do. I cannot accept you as long as you keep on asking people to accept you willingly. They will not do so. You will be disappointed again and again. I suggest that you creep on people without their being aware of it. The entire world will then be your slave. Who is she? The daughter of 
టైం కాల డు నాట్ బీ అఫ్రైట్ ఐ విల్ టీమ్ అప్ విత్ యూ సెడ్ యమా యమా ఆల్వేస్ టీమ్స్ అప్ విత్ టైం రైట్ దిస్ మై బ్రదర్ ప్రజ్వర and i will be with you all the time from today you are my sister and we will travel all over the world invisible to the eyes of men and when they are unmindful of us when they are unheeding you and prajavara creep on them i will do the rest the three travel together bent on destruction their army was made up of men of men named bhaya army was full of men called bhaya fear during their wandering they came upon the city of bhogavati which was guarded by the old snake prajagara and they thought the time was right for their own slot when he was unaware of it jara entered the body of puranjana she gained complete control of his body and he could do nothing about it time he was already 50 and the yavanas the assistants of death attacked the city on all sides puranjana was suffering great agony his body occupied by the invader jara and the city invaded by chandavega he found that he was being treated with indifference by everyone his children did not care for him any more his beloved wife puranjani frowned when he tried to make love to her hmm? she said how old do you think you are he could not invoke the old passion in him and he found to his dismay that he was himself too weak to indulge in love as he used to Puranjana looked all around. The city was falling to pieces under his eyes and he was helpless. Prajwara approached him and in his wake came Bhaya. Here, Puranjana was sorely distressed. Prajagara, the garden of the city, or the guardian of the city could not fight anymore. like a snake which tries to escape from the tree which has caught fire puranjana wanted to get away from the city of bhogavat he wept tears of despair he had no desire to let prajakara leave the city and go away at the same time he did not know what he had to do while he was thinking about this death came to him and claimed puranjan with his death the city of bhogavati fell to pieces and nothing was left of it except the name bhogavati now what happens puranjana's last thoughts were of the woman puranjan when he died when you are dying they say the last thought in your mind takes you where you come afterwards with the last thought in your mind is the divine lord then you go there if the last thought is something else then you go there but it is not easy only at the last minute to think of this is the problem people think when i'm about to go i will you know at time you'll only call on one who you've been calling all the time 
So, Puranjana's last thoughts were of the woman Puranjani when he died. So, what happened? The next birth, he was born as a woman. He was born as the daughter of the king of Vidarbha. The princess grew up to be a beautiful woman. Malayadhaja, the king of Pandya kingdom, married his this daughter of Vidarbha. The king of Pandya was a great devotee of Narayan. In course of time, seven sons and a daughter were born to them. When he became old, Malayadhaja Pandya left the kingdom in the hands of his sons and went off to Badri to seek solitude. His wife followed him. She abandoned her children and the comforts of the palace and went with him like the moonlight following the moon. Pandya performed tapasya, strictly following the rules set down for Ashtanga Yoga. He gave up his body, having realized the Brahman. Vidarbha, sorry, Vidarbi, Vaidharbi, his wife, had been serving him and attending to his wants. Dressed in tree bark with her form emaciated because of her austerities, her hair all knotted and unkempt because of negligence, she shone with her lord like a smokeless flame emanating from pure fire. When she found that her lord was dead, she set up a veil of pain and bathed her husband's body with her tears. She then collected wood, placed his body on it. She made up her mind that I also want to go with him. So she ascended the funeral pyre along with him. Nobody pushed her in. While she was weeping and mourning and preparing herself for the last journey, there came to her side a Brahman. The Brahman was Avinyata, the companion of Puranjana, in the days of long ago. He stood by her side and said, Consider my words for a moment. Who are you? Whose wife are you? You are now mourning the death of this man who is lying on the funeral pyre. Who is he? Try and think what there is between you and him that you should weep for him. Vaidharvi stopped crying and looked at him in bewilderment. The Brahmin said, My friend, you don't recognize me? Avijñata was the friend of Puranjana. And Puranjana is this lady, Vaidharvi. In the next word, he said, don't you recognize me? Do you remember that long, long ago, before you became involved with the things of the world, you had a friend called Avijñata? There seemed to be a spark of recognition in the eyes of Vaidharvi. Brahman went on, we were ever together, we were inseparable in those days. We were called the inseparables. You and I were like two swans floating on the surface of Manasa Lake. You were very dear to me and so was I to you. Suddenly you left my company. You were restless for the pleasures of the senses and you went away from me. You came to the city with the nine gates, Bhogavati. How many gates does the body have? Nine gates. Okay. You were restless for the pleasures of the senses and you went away from me. You came to the city with the nine gates, Bhogavati. Then you forgot all about me. But 
Time is now right for me to do what I have been longing to do since so, so long. I have been waiting to reveal myself to you and to take you back with me. I have come to tell you all about yourself. Forget this man and the misery you are going through because of his death. You do not belong here. Come with me and let us be happy once again. He paused for a moment and said, You are neither the man who married Puranjan, nor are you the princess Vaidharvi who married Malayadhvaja the Pandya. It has been all an illusion created by yourself because of your ignorance. Ignorance of your true nature. Puranjana, who was now wider, looked at the Brahmin with faint traces of recognition and waited for more words. Avijñata said, I will explain the entire phenomenon to you. You and I are the same. There is not a iota of difference between you and me. I am the Paramatma and you are the Jiva. The Manasa lake is the heart where we live together. We have always existed together. You are getting involved in the city of Bhogavati guarded by the serpent with five heads and with the woman Puranjani is all because of Maya. Bhogavati is the human body with its nine openings. Puranjani is the mind which enjoys the pleasures of the senses. When you became involved in them, you forgot your real nature. Avidya enveloped you and your involvement in the meshes of Maya and the bondage resulted from all these. You were really caught up in the web of Maya which is a resultant of your own desire to get involved with the things of the world. The more you tried, the deeper you became drowned in the ocean of samsara. You are really neither Puranjana, the lord of Puranjani, nor are you the wife of Malayadhvaja. Atman is without sex. It has no attachment. You are the reflection of me in the mirror. It so happens that the mirror has become clouded as a result of avarana. So, you were under the illusion that you belong to the body. The body was so easily destroyed by Chanda Vega, which is another name for time. Destroyed by old age, which is Jara and Prajwara all the diseases put together. You now have got rid of all of them. You have forgotten the truth about yourself. Now you are one with me. Let us go back to the lake where we used to float together, to the lake of Manasa Sarovara. Now this story was being told to the king Prachi Nabadis. So the king sat, we skipped. So the king sat silent for a while after Narada had related the story of Puranjana. Narada said, This is Brahma Vidya. Even as Narayana favors his devotees without their being aware of his presence. Mark this. Even as Narayana favors his devotees without their being aware of his presence, even so I have tried to make you realize the truth without making the lesson obvious. The teaching of Brahma Vidya was in the form of a story. I have tried to make you see yourself as imperishable. I wanted you to know the truth about yourself. 
Prajina Bharati said, please explain it more fully, my Lord. Ordinary mortals like me cannot grasp this. Narada said, I came to you only to teach Brahma Vidya. I am happy that you want to know more about it. Now, all are important stories, but we won't have time. Do we want to go into Vedanta or go to the next story? Narada is again explaining, so. Huh? <laughs> okay. It, this story also has content is spiritual, so we we'll, To, to put in short, King Prachin Abharis listened to all that Narada said and became enlightened. The Prachetasa brothers. The Prachetasa brothers were ten in number. And as already mentioned, they were the sons of Barhishat. He had asked them to perform tapasya in order to fit themselves to continue their line. They had accordingly set out to the forest to do what their father had asked them to do. They travelled towards the west. And while they were so engaged, they found an immense lake which was almost as large as the sea. It was filled with water which was clear, pure and without any waves. Like, like the mind of a sadhu which is without any agitation. Fish were there inside the lake and lotuses, red, white and blue, were floating on its surface. Water birds made sweet music, and this was echoed by the music of the bees, which were drunk with honey from the flowers surrounding. Perfume-laden breeze was blowing. They heard sweet music. They were intrigued as to where is this music coming? All of a sudden, out of the heart of the lake, rose the Lord Mahadeva with all his attendants. He was glowing golden and his beautiful neck was black with the poison that he had swallowed for the good of the world. A smile lit up his face and the princess, after a moment of stunned wonder, fell at his feet and worshipped him. He blessed them and said, all ten of them, I know you are the sons of Parishat and that you are great devotees of Narayana. I also know why you have come to the forest to perform tapasya. I have come here to help you. I will teach you the great incantation which will make you see the Lord in person. Mahadeva taught them the Rudra Gita, which is an invocation for Narayana. And said, if you repeat this mantra every day with a steady mind, you will attain whatever you desire. Then he vanished. The Prachet, 
Prajetasas entered the ocean and there they performed tapasya for a long time. Narayana, pleased with their devotion, appeared before them and said, I am pleased with your tapas. What do you desire most? Ask me. I know that you have been commanded by your father to perform tapasya to continue the line of kings. I assure you that a son will be born to you who will be a prajapati. His frame will spread all over the world. And he will be remembered by posterity. There was once a rishi by name Kandu. And he was performing intense tapasya. Indra, wherever somebody is performing tapasya, Indra goes and tries to create a problem. So Indra, with the intention of disturbing his tapasya, what did Indra do? He didn't poke him with a stick or hit him with a hammer. He did something very interesting. Hmm? He sent down to the earth an apsara called Pramalocha. The Rishi became so enamored of this apsara that he spent many years with her tasting the pleasures of the sense. He forgot all about his tapasya. A daughter was born to them. Now, Pramalocha abandoned the child in the forest and went back to her world. A child which was weeping was adopted by the trees of the forest. Taking pity on the child, the moon came and placed his index finger into her mouth and fed her with nectar. Can you imagine? The child is now a woman. Her beauty is heavenly. She will be the wife to all ten of you. And she will bear a son who will be a Prajapati. Rejatasas were overwhelmed by the sight of the Lord. Composing themselves, they fell at his feet and praised him. Accepting their worship with a gracious smile, Narayana also, like the Apsara, vanished from their sight. Always coming and vanishing feet. Brothers then rose out of the ocean and they saw the entire face of the earth covered by trees. Nothing could be discerned. They became angry and tried to burn the entire forest. Brahma came to them and said, Hey, don't do this. Trees are divine. The trees that were still remaining brought out their foster daughter called Marisha also known as Tarkshi, and gave her to the valiant brothers. He said, stop it, take this girl and go get married. All of them married her. A son was born to them and he was Daksha. It was the same Daksha Prajapati who had insulted Mahadeva long ago. Now he was born as a human being because of his disrespect to Mahadeva once upon a time. Son grew up. When he was old enough to be throned, the Prachetasas crowned him and left the kingdom for the forest. They also went. Everybody crown and get out. I'm looking whom to crown and get out. <clears throat> On the way, they met Narada. They spoke to him humbly and asked him to teach them the path to salvation. When he went away, they remembered his teachings and also remembered the words of the Lord. They set their minds on the feet of Narayana and soon reached him. Here ends the conversation between Maitreya and Vidura. 
Vidra takes leave of Maitreya and proceeds towards Astinapura. His sole aim in going there was to make his brother realize that he should abandon the world. We read that. While he was questioned by Yudhishthira about his travels, Vidura does not tell him about the tragedy at Prabhasa. He is very soft-hearted by nature and could not bear the sight of the sufferings in others. He did not have the heart to give them the terrible news about Krishna. So, there is some sadhu feeling. So, I have to go and no better thing to do. It is as good as reading the Bhagavad. Hmm? So, today I am going to go now. After we come back, I want to do the story of Jada Bharata. King Chitraketu. And then slowly move on to Hiranyakashyapu. We need to come.